I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, friends and viewers. Welcome back to Cinema Smorgasbord, Episode 3, where today we are going to be talking about some properties uh, from a variety of media that we think would make awesome film adaptations. Joining me today, as always, Mr. Don and Mr. MJ through the screen. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How you guys doing? Pretty good? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yep. So we're trying a new new system today of actually putting timers on things. So hopefully we won't have another hour and 45 minute episode. To anybody who made it through the last one, you're champion of all time. Uh, or and, fast forward. Or fast forward everything. master. Yeah. Watch us on 2x speed, please. It's yeah. for your own good. Yep. I talk very slowly. So <laughs> and I talk very quickly. Sense. So maybe 1.5 speed. <laughs> all right. So today, uh, before we get into our main topic, we were going to do a uh, touch base on episode two topics that I think, Don, you had some you wanted to follow up on. And uh, we were gonna yeah, do real quick. Uh, and I know you guys already know this, but uh, I watched Conquest and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I loved it. Um, it's a pure dream fantasy, like synthesizers. Uh, I drank it. All right. I watched it. I watched it without <laughs> drinking anything. Uh, I might do that differently next time. I feel like uh, now I'm I'm missing out on the bandwagon on this. I need to get my conquest done. But uh, I have to tell you though, I uh, I it some things looked familiar to me, and uh, I had checked my Netflix, and it turns out when I signed up for Netflix in 2006, I actually had seen this movie before. Uh, <laughs> oh. I was not I was not as as kind uh, in the rating. I think uh, how I rated things was a little differently, and. Um, and I was probably tired that night and uh, or whatever. And, and I always liked weird things, but I might just not have had. You weren't been, prepared I, for the bone nunchuck laser bow. Stuff. No, I, I might not been in the right frame of mind. I might have memory, don't remember, was your memory uh, as hazy as the film itself? Well, you know what? <laughs> I, I, the one thing I, I laughed a lot at how many shots where were with the sun dead center, like. <laughs> He was shooting this like the sun, and then people were <laughs> like backlight. Yeah, like yeah, backlight. yeah. <laughs> like reverse the proper. And, and I'm actually surprised it looked as good as it did, considering you know how how many shots he just took of the sun dead center. And for those who don't remember, Conquest was the Lucio Fulci right, uh, right. like space Conan movie from like what did we what was it, 83, 81, something like that. Uh, and we've mentioned it, it I think, early. in every episode so yeah, far. So yeah. uh, so it's become our like theme movie. Yep. <laughs> so everybody should go see it, and then eventually we'll do a, a Conquest episode where we just live commentate on the or whole thing. Talk about like barbarian movies with synthesizers. Yeah, and, yeah uh, there you yeah. go. Um, okay, so there's that. Uh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to get back uh, about Mind Hunter. I did eventually watch that, and uh, that was amazing. I like that one a lot. Um, I still have not dug in. As FBI first trial and errors of getting into the mind of serial killers, David Fincher. Um, yeah, yeah. I was. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised. After you know the four people that recommended, I you know, <laughs> I broke down and. And watched it, yeah. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. And do you want to go right into your uh, watching recently? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, well, uh, two things I want to mention, or I guess technically three. Uh, I watched The fu uh, Futile and Stupid Gesture. Oh, yeah. I saw that on Netflix, right? Yeah. 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 How was Actually, it? you know, this, this episode for me might be uh, gushing with Netflix. You know, like just... <laughs> Uh, and I have kind of a love hate relationship with that, and we can get into that at some future date. Um, but in this particular case, there's a lot of good stuff on Netflix. Uh, not always, but uh, right now, yeah. And uh, uh, Futile and Stupid Gesture is, uh, I guess, what I would call a docudrama D because it's, yeah, <laughs> documentary, drama, comedy. Uh, and about the the magazine um, National Lampoon, you know, from the magazine to the movies, and it's got an all star cast. And there is actually a if you don't know the story, there's kind of a twist at the end. I, I, you can kind of feel it coming, but there's something kind of odd, something not quite right. And um, I don't want to ruin it for anybody if nobody knows. Uh, 
but uh yeah i was just about was, to mention something and i was like Wait, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe people don't know and maybe it's part of the movie so i'll leave it so out. is this you're saying this is something that happened in the actual history of national lampoon yeah okay. yeah and uh and so i and anyway i i like i don't want to ruin that but uh I and, I don't know what it is, <laughs> <laughs> and you won't hear it from me. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed it so much, and I realized that also on instant was uh, a actual documentary on National Lampoon. Oh, is that like the Genius Stone Dead? Yeah, brilliant, drunk, or... uh, drunk Stone Brilliant Dead. There you go. Story of National Lampoon, um, and that was a couple years prior, 2015, and um, I, I had a I had a good night. Like I I really enjoyed both of those and. Yeah, I saw I, the futile, futile, stupid gesture. Gestures, yeah. I was, yeah, because it's like it's part interviews with a man who I, I don't know anything about yeah. Lampoon, but it's part interviews with him, and then it's also like recreated. Was it like Bill Hader plays him like in like the past or whatever? Yeah, it's like yeah. The, it's, I, so I, it's like there are so many cameos, of, yeah, celebrities, so right? many from cameos. like sort of Saturday Night Live crew. It looked like to me, yeah. like from yeah. like the early two thousand, maybe. So it's kind of like fictionalizing or like showing in in like an actual narrative film his stories from the interviews is that what it, yeah, yeah yeah i don't like i said i don't want to ruin too much but uh you you get a nice kind of rounded um view of of the history and and again you get kind of a second perspective with uh drunk stoned uh, brilliant dead um you know you get kevin bacon among other many other people uh talking about uh, yeah, National Lampoon. Nice. Yep. Are you a National Lampoon holic, MJ? I know you were you were texting me about watching Caddyshack for the first time <laughs> in a while recently. Yeah, uh, I'm not like a, a huge National Lampoon's fan, but I, I I do know a decent amount about like the surrounding events, especially Caddyshack in itself. <clears throat> I don't know if they go into that in the documentary, um, but like. Yeah, they. Like, I mean, they go into everything. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, I I know that it has a really interesting history and and just kind of everything that that came up around it. So, and the especially the guy who 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 ran it was it he was he was he the the head honcho of the, yeah Kenny, anyway there was another guy too um, but. Uh, yeah, I'd... trying to be vague as vague as possible. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm very I curious as to what wanna, happened in this. I just because I, I, I don't know what this need is in me for people to see things the way that I saw it, but <laughs> but in this particular case and, and some other movies, I really liked the surprise and how how it was done. You know what's and, funny is I have the opposite. Like I almost always, I don't know why, but I'm like broken in this way for movies. I almost always look up the plot like why yeah. I, I, tell you what. I, I just do i don't i don't know why <laughs> but i always and then i like something about me kind of like enjoys seeing the things unfold like once i know what's going on rather than like having the mystery there and i, I don't had, know why i had, I had, a, had that problem i had a literature professor actually say that oh they he, read the end of the book first read it the end yeah. of the book first yeah i've heard people say that too so i when we are done here i will ruin the ending for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah i don't know i've just always enjoyed like it's to me getting spoiled on something isn't so bad as long as i like what like in enjoying the process of the movie if that makes sense I'm, yeah i don't know i like being surprised i like you yeah. know kind of having a double take yeah so so han solo dies <laughs> spoiler alert for you know Force somebody <laughs> did that in the theater oh like when you were watching the movie uh in, like in the, the moment between the uh previews and that moment of silence and then when it goes somebody bah, 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 bah. That, before that yeah, yeah somebody yelled that Han and, is dead yeah yikes that's pretty mean that was lame <laughs> in, and in like the theater, i like i somebody else had kind of ruined it prior to that so a lot of people like to ruin things but uh but but the, the, like even knowing that uh having the guy do that, yeah like was, in the middle of a movie uh, theater, yeah, yeah total dick that's pretty that's pretty yeah. bad I wonder we that would be an interesting uh, episode is like the greatest spoilers of all time. Yeah. Greatest twist yeah, of all yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Haunted, <laughs> it's like just don't watch this. Don't episode. watch this episode. <laughs> Actually, that's true. It would probably be an episode that nobody watches because they don't want to get spoiled on all the things. That'll be the one that everyone watches. There so. you go. We'll uh, just do full conquest spoilers. Watch did out. you want to go around or should I finish up with this? Oh, uh, whatever you want. Okay. Uh the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I was very surprised by uh, another Netflix original, um, Altered Carbon. Um, 
I've heard good things. Yeah, I, uh, I I'm also really surprised. Uh, it's cyberpunk, you know, very Blade Runner. Philip Philip K. Dick would be proud of this one, I think. <laughs> um, lots of playing with reality and and uh, uh, you know different skins and things like that. Uh, it's a f- flawless future world effects, uh, diverse cast. Lots of male and f- female nudity. You know, if you're into that kind of thing, <laughs> you're going to want to see this one. And, you know, the story just unfolds in a really nice way. Um, that you can, you will definitely want to rewatch, uh, catch little things that you, you remember, but you know, you'll just see it in a whole new way. Um, I was really surprised by it. And, um, and especially, uh, we can get back get into Cloverfield Paradox. Um, I feel like as soon as they um, announced Altered Carbon, they kind of just brushed it under the rug. And I know they, they spent a lot of money on the thing. Was uh, it a Netflix original or was it like taken over from the BBC or something? I don't know. Was, uh, I don't yeah, know. I, uh, I thought it was a Netflix original. It's hard to know sometimes because some of the ones like the end of the effing world, like that was actually like a bbc channel 4 series like months before it came to netflix in the u.s okay. and then it was kind of like taken netflix over. original okay. sort of like the free you know, premieres in the u.s but what, like not really wasn't black mirror the first season? black mirror was also a british show that was bought and okay. black mirror though now is owned straight up by netflix so like new episode new seasons of black mirror are netflix uh originals but and again originally it wasn't to their credit i think um a lot of times when that happens, it it just goes downhill. But I think they've <laughs> they've run with it and they've done a good job with that as well. I you know I, I we can do another episode where I say really bad things about Netflix, but <laughs> but in this this particular one, I think there are some really good. Things. This last two weeks, we had a good relationship. Oh yeah, Netflix, yeah, you know? yeah. MJ, what you got? What you've been watching recently? Anything uh, tasty to dig into? Um. I haven't really been watching a whole lot. Uh, for example, I've just watched I've watched three movies since the last time oh, recording. Dang. But they're all conquests. Not... <laughs> conquests three times over. <laughs> yeah. No. Um well one, I've been watching a lot of Dragon Ball Z. I'm trying to finish the series Me too. out. Me too. Uh so I watched uh, all of season seven and eight, and I'm in the middle of season nine right now. I can't even uh, like uh, equate that because I'm watching the Kai redos. So I'm like, yeah. So you're not, you're. <clears throat> I'm be- at the I part they... where you're learning, like fusion to fight Boo. Okay, so me too. They were close. Except yeah, for they were close. they're in the the time chamber at this point. Okay, yeah. So you're a little um, than me. But I'm watching the the not the, the un- Kai unkai version. version. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like four episodes per one Kai episode. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's been a long time since I've seen it uh so that's good um i'm also watching it in japanese because english uh dubs are, uh, the english dub for dragon ball z is hot garbage and <laughs> I, I, I like i like the kai one i don't i haven't seen the original english dub in a while, so I couldn't even... the kai one might be better because they've been doing it for a while but actors, though, honestly. yeah 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 it's the same actors but i think they redid redid it all but um yeah so watching it in japanese and and it's it's nice. It's uh, enjoyable. I'm I'm really liking the uh, probably season eight and season nine are probably my favorite so far. Uh, it's good. The animation because, gets a lot better, I think. Well, the animation gets better, which is fine. But I, I also like the tone of it. It gets like really dark in parts where mm-hmm. you're just kind of like, whoa, that's really fucked up. Like there's moments where there's one scene. I don't know if this is in Kai, but uh, there's one scene where Majin Buu. Uh, Fat Majin Buu is like flying and he's about to kill a little kid and then the kid's blind so he cures the kid's blindness so that way he can see him and fear him. I don't think, no, I don't think that's in uh, Kai actually. Mm -hmm. And then the kid, because he's never seen him, he doesn't know who this person is, uh, the kid thanks him and like they become friends kind of and um, but like just in that moment and he, the kid tells him that he was going to go buy milk with some money and he gives the money to Majin Buu and he's like money's tastes awful because he tries to eat it and he's like hold on I'll be right back and he goes he finds a person turns the person into milk and then goes and takes it to the little kid and gives him to drink (laughs) so there's part of me that's like oh that's really sweet like you get this really like 
you get to see where like Majin Buu's like childlike innocence is and where he kind of he's malleable in whether or not he's good or bad. <clears throat> and then you also have this thing where you're like, he's feeding that little child human. Like he's feeding him people. Soylent milk. Soylent milk. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, that's really fucked up. Uh, <laughs> so there's stuff like that. Um that I, I actually really fine. enjoyed like the great say a man like Gohan going to high school bits. I don't know. I I, I kind of like where it like when it, that's yeah like i think it, like a lot of like relax a little bit and it's not just like constant fighting like tournament stuff like yeah that. that's what got me with like the cell saga after a while i was like holy shit i don't care because yeah. it was just like i'm tough no i'm tough and it was just I've like that for... like tough no <laughs> he's tougher than i thought we could get and i was like oh my god yeah <laughs> and this like this season eight and season nine so far have been like a good mixture of that with like comedy a little bit of dark undertones a little like you know they they mix it up really well and i'm enjoying that it's not as like exhausting as it as it is when it's like just pure seriousness yeah i agree um so i've been watching a lot of that that's probably why i haven't seen a lot of movies um let's see last time we recorded as soon as we finished i've i watched uh the what is it the discreet charms of the of the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to f- feel about it i didn't love it but i didn't dislike it either i understand like there was moments that made me laugh a lot and then there's other moments where i felt really disconnected from the movie as to where i was like uh i don't know how to feel like i just i didn't it's like right down the middle for me and it might be one of those movies like the more i watch it the more i'll enjoy it over time but for now it's kind of like i that was good enough like i don't have an 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 inkling to to revisit it anytime soon i've i've seen that a few times and that like many years ago i think on vhs and more recently i uh probably probably on blu-ray um and i i i don't i wouldn't say i love it love it but um i very strongly like it a lot (laughs) i saw it one time in college when i was in the mode of just being like going to the library and like typing in like what are movies you should see and then you know like checking out all those movies yeah and i saw it then and i it just totally did not connect with me i yeah. would be interested to re to rewatch it now because i have a much wider like knowledge of film than i did back then but um it totally was not my thing at the at that well, time um so i don't know i i'm i don't i haven't seen it recently enough to really give strong commentary on it but i just remember it not really sitting with me in the I I remember uh, my favorite part about it was when they changed the actress at one point. Oh so yeah, one actress is uh, <laughs> like a different actress is playing the same character at one point, like Carol Bouquet, or I think that's who it was. And um, I just I, something about that, like I really loved loved that. Yeah, um, there's there's things that are I think were really funny. Like there's a whole scene where uh, the guys at the dinner party. Uh, like the general's dinner party he's the ambassador so like that fake uh like what is it it's not uh like south american like he's the ambassador to some south american uh state or whatever and like the entire time every single person he goes up to they're always like oh yeah isn't like aren't they really corrupt there and he's like oh uh, i gotta go and like he turns around (laughs) and tries to like he tries to avoid the conversation but every single person he talks to ends up like that's where it goes like automatically right away and i thought that was hilarious Mm -hmm. um i like there's other things like with the the bishop and stuff like (laughs) uh blowing that dude away and just certain things like that i i found very funny um but overall i I, there's also other things where i was just kind of disconnected from it but like i said over time it's so it'll be one i revisit but not anytime soon um i also watched a uh i want to see it's a enzo g castellari film i forget who, if it was a, him that directed it hold on sorry i'm gonna look at my phone real quick yes okay enzo g castellari uh it's a another polizio tecci euro crime film uh called heroin busters oh, star- starring uh fabio testi fabio a, testi he's dude, my favorite he's, <laughs> yeah he's so good and have you seen this one have you uh, uh maybe 
Head, and there's uh, like a whole like, like a uh, plane scene at the very end where it's actually Fabio Testi flying the plane and they're like <laughs> doing stunts and stuff. It's crazy. Uh, I don't know if I've seen that one. I, I'm trying to think of uh, some of the other ones. Uh, I, one of my favorites that's not the crime is um, uh, the importance thing. The important thing is to love. Uh, uh, okay, that uh, that's crazy. And um, I don't even know this yeah. guy at all. <laughs> well, uh, uh, he's a he's a really like he's a really handsome Italian yeah. actor, but he's yeah, yeah. he's yeah. also used to be a stuntman. Um, so in a lot of like these kind of action Italian action films, it's him doing like everything. Oh, yeah. That's cool. And what? um you can actually say he's actually in um um holy crap, I'm forgetting. Once upon a time in the West, if I remember oh, really? right. Okay. He's like one he's of in... the guys that gets shot and like falls off of a roof. <laughs> like, he was in a movie the... with uh Oliver Reed and I I'm uh Dude, Oliver I'm Reed's in a bunch of it like italian stuff too <laughs> i think he probably just got paid in alcohol yeah uh, have you ever seen venom i think yeah yeah With, yeah, uh, yeah. Klaus, klaus kinski and, yeah. and they hated it the anyway uh oh, side well there's a story <laughs> i think actually on the dvd to uh one of the films that he that he did with oliver reed uh, apparently he got into a lot of fights with the uh the crew and um and oliver reed it did or is uh, this yeah 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 okay. and fabio yeah. testi is telling the story uh now and um and he said something like uh he owed them a lot he owed them money or they no one of the they were waiting to uh like the crew was waiting to beat him up <laughs> after the movie was done uh they were gonna wait until the movie was done and um uh oliver reed was smart enough not to show up for the for last the final day because yeah. <laughs> i think he kind of knew that was going to happen and uh yeah it sounded like he yeah he seems like the, the most interesting character that was interesting <laughs> but um yeah anyway uh the movie i watch is called heroin busters fabio testi it's a uh, kind of a typical uh euro crime film lots of uh, crazy action um uh, lots of like over the top manliness going on. Mm -hmm. uh, like Stashes? I said, there's a, yeah, no, not with Fabio, not Fabio Testi. He's like a kind of like a five o'clock shadow type oh, okay, guy. Yeah, but I like that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this one was really good too. Uh, mainly because like, like I said, Fabio Testi was a stunt man. Um, so a lot of the scenes where there's like stunts happening, where he's like jumping motorcycles and at the very end, there's a whole like scene where it's a literally a chase, a plane chase. Like one guy gets away in a plane and then Fabio Testi gets in a plane and then flies after him. And I was like, wait a second. Is that really Fabio? And it, they're like, you know, <laughs> dodging each other in the air and stuff. And he's like going under bridges and it's pretty crazy. And I even had to like I went through the audio commentary because the, the DVD that I have has the audio commentary with him uh with enzo g castellari talking about it and he's like oh yeah he's a professional pilot and you know <laughs> so we just let him do it and it was like holy shit uh he's, such so that, he's a cool dude like <laughs> he's I, just like i was gonna cool. say the same thing apparently uh i guess I, i'm trying to remember i mean he's like a household name i think in italy and uh but he has like i i don't think he acts that much anymore i could be wrong about that but no, he hasn't he's, he hasn't acted in a while. I think I think he has like some kind of farm, like a uh, but I can't forget what human kind. human milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Soylent farm. Soylent farm. Um so yeah, I watched that one. It was very enjoyable. And uh I watched another movie, and I'm probably gonna offend some people by saying this, and I'm sorry, Will, because you'll oh. probably also lose your uh... No, I saw this on your uh, on your letterbox <laughs> thing. I'm not monetizing <laughs> these anyway. Okay, I was going to say, you're going to lose your monetization just because of this. But this is the title of the movie. I don't like saying racial epithets, but here it is. The movie's called Boss Nigger. Um, it was written and stars, uh, written by and stars uh, Fred Williamson. It's a black exploitation western. Uh, I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it because uh, there's moments where it gets real goofy. 
and it, it kind of like revels in that goofiness a little it revels in the goofiness a little bit too much for my liking uh it has a kick-ass theme song though uh but essentially what it is is that uh fred williamson and his partner are bounty hunters and they're black and they're in the west so everywhere they go it's kind of like blazing saddles but taken a little bit more seriously a little bit so essentially they ride into a town the town is somewhat corrupt and missing a sheriff like they do not have a sheriff there and Fred Williamson pretty much forces his way into becoming the sheriff of the town. And everybody there, you know, there's a lot of like racial humor going on. And every single time uh, somebody like, you know, calls him the N word or whatever, like his partner's like, you broke a rule and like arrests them and charge them <laughs> and stuff. So it, like there's stuff like that that's really entertaining. And then you get Fred Williamson just being a badass and like punching dudes out and just being ultra cool but then you get a little bit of like slapstick goofiness uh it's kind of it kind of i don't know it's it's weird the tone because you get like this like badass black exploitation stuff and then you get like this kind of slapstick hmm. weirdness going on but overall like there's moments that i thought were really really entertaining and i'm glad i watched it but i wouldn't say it's one that i'm gonna be like going down in my top like black exploitation movies that i love so interesting fred williamson's the guy from uh it's a vigilante that one you turned me on to right yeah. yeah he's the he's the yeah dude oh he's my like god vigilante leader or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah man fred williamson's so kick-ass was he a, was he a was he an athlete before he was yeah a, he was a fo- uh, pro football player, pro football player. Football. yeah I, was, I remember like reading up about him when when i watched vigilante like last year or something and i was like this guy just seems like a boss like he just seems like a cool dude like like he just did it all you know like just lived life and and was awesome and he yeah, still is cool. he's still doing like cool just stuff like fabio testi just like fabio <laughs> testi yeah so if, if if nothing else look up those two dudes yeah and, or any of the other like black exploitation stars, like uh, Jim Brown, who's also a football player, and then became. Oh no! Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, and then they did movies together, a few westerns, and some other like black exploitation stuff. It was really good. Anyway, nice. <laughs> that right was on. my viewing. I'm gonna bust through mine real quick. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, which I am, I'm curious. I wanted to talk about this because I want people to comment uh, in, on this video and tell me if I'm crazy if you've seen this movie. Or if um or if you agree with me, but it's uh, three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. Yeah, seen I, it. I've heard really good things. I fucking hated it. Oh really? <laughs> I thought it was terrible. Yeah. Oh, I went to see it like two or a week and a half ago or so uh, in the theater, um, and I really just liked it. And that's why I'm curious because I've read most of everything that I've read has been very positive, like nine out of ten. Yeah, you know. Yeah oscar nominations well, even, and stuff even the uh the ad for it just seemed like oh yeah really, really I, and cool. that's what I, I going into it i was expecting it to be pretty good um and i don't know if maybe i was in a bad mood or what i don't know what but um but <laughs> i really disliked it a lot um and i i saw one other guy online who wrote a kind of really negative review that i sort of also agreed with the, and i think the crux of it is that like i just think the script is really bad i think it's really unpolished and and it's weird because i like it's martin mcdonough i think is how you say his name and i love in bruges like he wrote and directed in bruges he wrote and directed seven psychopaths and he wrote and directed this um and he's a playwright as well um i think like one of the more celebrated modern playwrights um and i just thought this was a really sloppy lazy movie like a lot of the jokes i thought weren't jokes like the jokes were just people saying like the n-word and saying retard and like saying like oh there's a midget and they're, like it was just people like saying filthy things being and crass everybody in the theater yeah and then everybody in the theater was laughing because it's like ha it's 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 sam rockwell and uh francis mcdormand like just saying retard over and over and i was like that's not a joke like yeah. it's and it was really frustrating to me like there's literally they do a fucking who's on first thing like there's a time where sam rockwell like rolls up to the a billboard and he's like what's that and the guy's like what's well, what that's what what do you mean what's what that's that. like it's it's such lazy writing it was blowing my mind that like people were loving it because i was like this is cheap <laughs> jokes like, maybe these it's are not that that routine's so old hey, dude, that, like <laughs> i was it just was blowing my mind like i just felt like all the times that things were happening that people were laughing like it was just 
like Peter Dinklage is in it and she goes on a date with him uh, at some one point in the movie. It's not like that's not like a spoiler. And like she sees her ex-husband and her ex-husband's like, oh, well, you can date as many midgets as you want. And the whole theater's like, <laughs> and I'm like, that's not yeah. a joke. Like, that's just saying I, I re- really frustrating to me. I felt like it was a super sloppy script. I feel like it wasn't clever. Like it wasn't executing jokes and premises. It was just like a bunch of characters that I didn't care about doing terrible things to each other and being like crass. And I don't know. I would love to see. I want, I want other people to tell me what you thought of it. Like if, if you liked it, you know, what I, what did you like about it so much? Or what, what am I missing? Like, I know Francis McDormand is getting a lot of praise. I thought she was fine. I think people like seeing that character of like, I'm a downtrodden, you know, badass woman and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get my stuff, you know, sorted out. I think people like cheering for that character. Yeah. So I, I understand that, but like, whew, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was like one of the, one of the worst movies I can remember seeing um, recently. It just was not my cup of tea. I, you know, honestly, I've seen several movies. Uh, one in the recent past called, I think happy, happy time or something like that and uh it's the same exact thing that you're saying where it's just a lot of like you're just cringing it the is whole it's time. like cringe humor it's like and and i maybe <sighs> somebody found that uh entertaining but i just it brings me down i end up going kind of like 1.5 speed throughout the whole thing and you know <laughs> until it's over just to say i watched it and, you know because yeah. then it's like simultaneously i watched the noah baumbach movie the meyerwitz stories the new and selected ones on netflix and i love that movie and like it kind of, it's kind of a similar thing where it's like it's not a similar thing i'm just going to equate it in my mind to like justify myself but it's not really a similar thing but in the sense of like they're both dry comedies about like kind of people that are fucked up and like do bad things to each other but like the way that it's written like it's so smart and clever and fun and like things tie back into themselves and you you see things happening and then there's payoffs at the end like and i just did not get that from three billboards like i just really felt like it was poorly constructed tell me what you think in the comments and i would love for you guys to see it at some point and tell me you know where you lie on the scale because because that was a weird one for me I also wanted to say really quickly, just shouts out, wanted to recommend uh, the films of Yorgos Lantimos. I'm probably saying that terribly wrong, but he's been one of my favorite directors for the last couple of years. I just watched The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which was his movie from 2017. I've also watched um, Dogtooth and The oh, Lobster. Yeah. Love that. I love, I, lo- I, I honestly think like, I really and truly think that he is an actual genius. Like, I think this guy, I've liked all of his movies that I've seen. I think The Lobster was my favorite. Dogtooth like just weirdly came onto my radar. I think it won or was nominated for a best foreign film like when it came out in maybe 2009. Oh, yeah, I love that one. I picked I that love up. It. It's so yeah. good. And all of his movies are kind of like these weird microcosm stories that explore bigger themes. So like Dogtooth is kind of about like growing up in isolation and like what sex and violence brings into innocence. And then the lobster is kind of like this microcosm of like relationships in the modern day. And, uh, killing of the sacred deer is kind of a, a similar to the lobster it's like a family tight family story this kind of microcosm thing and when something bad happens when the dad does something bad in his past like having to uh like have a reckoning for that sort of like justice being done for things in your past i mean i love them all and i i really think like i i've liked all the movies and i really think that that man has like a 10 out of 10 true masterpiece in him uh and i i don't know like if he's i think every movie he's like growing and learning and i'm so excited to see where he goes in the next decade or so because i like i think he's legitimately brilliant and i think he has um a lot to say and i love him yeah it's it's great when you see somebody thinking yeah and and it's exciting to see that that to know that he's still making movies and like it's not like stanley kubrick or whatever where it's like oh my god it's so amazing but he's also dead and is never going to make another movie you know like guys from the 70s and like the uh, lentimos is one of my absolute favorites uh modern directors um i I don't i know i was texting you mj about some of his stuff but i don't remember if you'd seen it or not no i haven't i i have it on uh my voodoo account like just sitting there waiting for me to watch yeah, I would. Right. I mean, I recommend it to anybody who, who's into film. He has like a particular style that's kind of like all of his characters speak very plainly and like very straightforward. They're kind of like not real like 
rounded characters. They're kind of more like, I'm going to say something now. Well, I'm going to say something in response because the characters each kind of like represent things. So it might not be everybody's thing, but I really enjoyed it. And then I also just really quickly wanted to touch on the Cloverfield stuff because um, I rewatched Cloverfield. Uh, I watched 10 Cloverfield Lane for the first time, and then I watched the Cloverfield Paradox. I thought the Cloverfield Paradox was pretty messy. Um, I know you have watched it, Don, and I know, MJ, I think you had not yet. No. Um, I think it just has like a really weak script. I think the casting is like actually kind of brilliant. Like the cast is really good. Like it's a lot. I mean, of great I would have, I would have. Well, I, I like the Ten Cloverfield Lane a lot, and yeah. so I would have watched this anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, O'Dowd, uh, yeah, uh, who that, plays, who I would, the Irish. Uh, he would have brought me in yeah, anyway. He's yeah. great. And then the um, uh, Daniel Brühl, I really like yeah, the line yeah, yeah. from like uh, Inglorious Bastards and Goodbye Lennon. John Zong, what's his name? John Zui, who's um. You might know from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and uh, Hero, and some other stuff. Um, and then some other actors who I didn't know who were not as big. But either way, the casting's really pretty good. I think the script is super weak. I think it doesn't know what it wants to be. Like, it's partially a body horror movie. It's partially, like, a sci-fi horror movie. And then it's also partially, like, a monster movie. And I think it it does all three of them, like, tepidly and doesn't quite land on one thing well i kind of I, I can i just say yeah. I, I feel like there are a lot of uh a lot of those alien kind of movies and like mm-hmm. last year we had one called life life yeah i want to see that actually the, and, and it was good and i and i i thought cloverfield paradox was good i i i liked it but um for me it was like around like a four and a half five i thought yeah. it was like very mediocre i don't know like and i felt sort of the same way about 10 cloverfield lane not in the sense that it was like a four and a half, five. I, I like that one. I was probably like a seven ish for me, something in there, but both were movies that I felt would have been better movies without the Cloverfield stuff shoehorned in them. Like I kind of like the idea of like, Oh, here's a survival bunker movie. And then at the end, it kind of goes, I will oh, see. I weird. And then I with this that, one, though. it was like, there was like a kernel in here where it's like international space station, things are going wrong. Wars about to break out you know, our people's alliance is going to stay with their countries or whatever. like, there's kind of like cool stuff going on yeah. in Cloverfield paradox, but then it kind of shoehorns in like monster stuff, like on the ground and in the hospital and whatever. And I was like, I eh, wasn't really feeling it. I kind of am worried that, because I know that there's another Cloverfield movie set to be released this year. That's going to be oh, a world war two. I thought movie. I thought that no, was, that's the... not this. There's okay. Four, there's I misunderstood one for this year. Yeah. Okay. This movie was originally called God particle. And then became Cloverfield. Paradox. Okay. This next one is called Overlord, and it's going to be a World War II Cloverfield movie. Because, slight spoiler alert: the Cloverfield Paradox basically opens up the multiverse for any time and any place on Earth to be a Cloverfield movie. Is what like the crux of the par- of the paradox is. Will um, there be Nazi zombies? I don't know. Okay. But my point, my kind of <laughs> what I wanted to say was that okay. it's a little bit disappointing to me when I know a movie is a Cloverfield movie from the outset, you know, cause it's kind of like, it could be kind of cool and shocking to like, Oh, you thought this was just a world war two movie, but actually it's about fucking crazy alien monsters. But like, if I, if, if you, if it's already established to be part of the Cloverfield multiverse, I just don't know how far they can push it every time. Cause every time you're kind of expecting like, where's the, where's the monster? Where's, where's the alien stuff? So I don't know. I'm curious to see where that franchise goes. I think it's in kind of a weird place. Because Cloverfield, the first one, is really like a, I think a really fun, tight, cool movie, and I don't know if it needed all of this extra skin grafted onto it. Um, you know, like because these all of these movies, if you look at the production history, like Ten Cloverfield Lane, The Cloverfield Paradox, were both written as spec scripts that had nothing to do with Cloverfield, and then were bought and transmogrified into uh, yeah. Cloverfield movies. So I sort of feel like I don't. I don't like want it to get its hands on too many things. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit iffy on it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I just wanted to mention it real quick that like I watched it. I, I didn't love the paradox, but I have liked Cloverfield in the past and I want to like it in the future. I'm just not sure the direction they're going with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I back to what I was saying before. I, I liked uh, Cloverfield paradox, but I think it's a shame that it overshadowed the um, altered carbon and kind of just kind of basically pushed yeah, it stunt, away like and... stunt marketing you know they kind of like because it was like a super bowl in the middle of the super bowl yeah they were like yeah 
I was watching the Super Bowl and it was like Cloverfield Paradox, like right after the game. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like, yeah, that's, that's kind of stunt marketing is kind of weird. Uh, I don't know. Are you a, are you a Cloverfield Universe fan at all, uh, MJ? The Cloververse? I haven't seen any of them, so I couldn't tell None you. None of them at all. Okay. I would actually, I think the first one's really good. It's directed by Matt Reeves, who did uh, like the Planet of the, uh, the most recent Planet of the Apes stuff. And um, 10, 10 Cloverfield Lane is probably probably my favorite. I like the, the first group. one more. Yeah. I like the first one more. Cause I think like the found footage stuff, I think, I, I think it works. And I think the blocking and like the way it's shot is really smart with like the extras and everything but i i i that stuff weighs on me after yeah, a while. like it's, it's the shaky cam wild yeah stuff. it's uh it's also very clever but um it just after a while it's like okay i get the idea and just tell me the story yeah i know and 10 cloverfield was very smart in a lot of ways because like there are the thing that i didn't like about the script in cloverfield paradox is like so at the beginning, for example, you just see a monitor and it's like, there's a guy on the on it and he's like, this will open up a dimensional tear for aliens and monsters. I'm like, oh, well, way to like, you know, spunk the exact plot of the movie <laughs> in my face, like, so to make sure I'm like, not dumb enough to miss it. But with 10 Cloverfield Lane, like the way it kind of unveils itself and the sort of like reasons you start to understand, like why John Goodman's character is acting the way he is and stuff like, I think that's actually really smart because it yeah. never explicitly goes out and says this is what john goodman's character did in the past but the way he starts to act and behave you sort of start to feel like oh like that's pretty creepy <laughs> like you know and i think i wish that cloverfield paradox was smarter written it just felt too on the nose felt too too straightforward for me so now we're going to move into the main section of the podcast uh which is going to take up as much time as our what we've been watching section of the podcast but uh after a comment on our last video went up, somebody was asking me what kind of comics we would like to see adapted into films. So I tasked these two gentlemen and myself with picking out uh, some type of franchise, either a comic book or an anime or a regular book or anything like that. Something that we would like to see turned into films that either hasn't been turned into a film or maybe the franchise is not uh, currently active. So we each came up with a couple ideas of films we would like to see adapted from different media properties. So, uh, MG, I don't know how many you did. I think Don and I each did two. Where are you on, on the list of any? <laughs> I'm, you on have like, any? I'm on like zero, dude. I'm on like zero, okay. <laughs> I'll um, come up with something. Come Please. up with something on the fly. Uh, Don, do you want to yep. start or do you want me to do it? <clears throat> um, I can start. Okay. So this is uh, Don's first choice for adapted I have movies. two main ones and then two for later, maybe, if... Uh, we get to that. Uh, I guess my uh, first main one would be. Um, oh, I should I should mention a few days ago, Elon Musk uh, using the Falcon Heavy rocket shot a red roadster into space. Did it survive? Uh, and it did. Yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah. it's just There's orbiting. There's a, a cool picture of like a space guy, like a spaceman in the car, like just driving it with its arm up. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I haven't seen that. And so uh, I, I've this is it reminded me of something I've been thinking about for a long time, which is I would like to see, um, uh, a like a re visualization of the heavy metal movie. Uh, Maybe using like new new content from the heavy metal magazines. Um, it was a it was like a pure pure fantasy. Um, was that Ralph Bakshi? Uh, I don't think. Is that the was that, that, that the Fritz the Cat guy? <laughs> no, <laughs> he did some other stuff. I don't think he was in that. It, it was it I was don't know a, much a about lot of US different animation from that time. Uh, a lot of different animators, and I think they were kind of using Mobius and. Um, uh, some of the other, I guess, from the the French version, the metal herlon, metal herlon, <laughs> metal. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it means screaming metal. What he said, and, which is a cooler uh, title, I think. Uh, yeah, I think metal. so. Yeah, screaming metal. Um, and anyway, that that movie uh, opens up with a guy in a car, and I think they were trying to play off of that actually, uh, with the with the red roadster, but. Um, yeah, I think I, you know, uh, maybe some of the recent stories uh, with the the editor uh, for the magazine now, Grant Morrison. Uh, you know, they could they could do live action. They could do the computer animation. Um, Is there any like specific 
either animation studio or like a talent or anything that you would that you like in your mind you would want to attach to it uh not really i wrote down some names but i mean god uh it could be anybody and you know it, it like us they would be kind of limited for time and i think <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of them probably wouldn't want that uh i would i wrote down tarantino the uh Taika Waititi. Taika Waititi. He yeah. could be. He could do a cool one. Yeah, I think, I think sure. so. Uh, Luke Besson, Guillermo yeah. del Toro yeah. might be good. If you know, if they oh even, man, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome yeah. With those guys, I, that would I be think awesome. he would. Uh, you know, he would. He would get into that. Um, I was going to say also again. Again, go, getting back to Netflix, it might be something they want to pick up because um, I've noticed a lot of their anime recently. Uh, some of it's just top notch. The, uh, the computer, it sort of looks like anime, but it's like definitely computer done, uh, computer uh, generated and um, uh, just so good. Uh, there's one called Ajin. A- a- um, there's another Blame. And more recently, the oh, God- yeah, I know Blame's adapted from manga. Uh, Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters. Uh, if you want to see any of this, God- Godzilla is almost like, I feel like I saw a Gundam. It wasn't really, you know, it, it, it had a Gundam with a monster in it. Uh, that's what it felt like. And um, maybe they'd want to tackle something like that, you know, just with a fantasy um, slant. And um, I was thinking another, uh, just, I'm just putting this out there, but another way to go would be maybe like the Warren publications, uh, Creepy and Eerie. Um, and some other titles I was thinking was uh, were Nexus and uh, Paul Chadwick's Concrete. It'd be kind of weird, but uh, I think I think the the superhero uh, superhero movies need new breath uh, breathed in them uh, as much as possible, or oh, yeah. you know, they're just gonna die. So yeah, go, like that go the way of the More Western anthology stuff. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. And with those, uh, uh, I think those are those are excellent choices for directors too to be attached to that. Like Luke Besson, I think would be a good one. There's so many. Yeah, uh, yeah. there are a lot of choices. Um, nice. Yeah. Dope. So that's my first one. Most excellent. My first pick. This is like my dream. I would love to see this movie. This is the Cowboy Bebop movie as casted by Will. <laughs> is this live or this is a live action okay. yeah yeah so i <laughs> love cowboy bebop i yeah. really really love cowboy bebop a lot um it's only like 26 episodes maybe yeah. it's not long it's not a long series um but i think and a what, movie um, and a movie yep the knocking on heaven's no, door the movie the music is, is i'm fantastic. okay on the movie um but it's a i think it's a fantastic series and i think what is great about it is the kind of the mood is this sort of feeling of like melancholia and like displacement uh in space kind of like floating around chasing money or or chasing some kind of lost sense of purpose and kind of floating through like a lot of the reason i like cowboy bebop is because it's basically like each episode is, is its own short story about some aspect of space and the future and how humans interact with that and how everybody's kind of like bummed out in space space you know it's kind of like it's this like ultimate kind of like acid jazz laid back kind of bummer thing but there's also some joy in it too like it's funny and it's irreverent um but for my choice for this movie i would want it be to be directed by wong kar wai Ah. i want wong kar wai to direct a cowboy bebop movie because i think he's touched with like 2046 on like sci-fi so he He's kind of like touched on that thing, but when I think of like in the mood for love or or any of his older movies, I've actually seen Chunking Express, which I know everybody tells me I need to. But like when I think of his movies, I think of them as more of like feelings and moods and kind of the way that characters like look and interact with each other is like very. It kind of says a lot without being very dialogue heavy, and I think like he could bring that feeling of like melancholia to bebop in a way that would be really exciting i i think for for me um i would want it to be written by the guys who wrote bebop who is uh, shinshiro watanabe and keiko nobumoto um watanabe was the director of cowboy bebop he's also directed samurai champloo um kids on the slope and space dandy which i love space dandy too and i love samurai champloo i just think he's a brilliant (laughs) director um and then and the guy who wrote uh keiko nobumoto 
he also wrote episodes of Space Dandy as well as writing Cowboy Bebop and Cowboy Bebop the movie. Um, so I would just want to bring them in and like, frankly, what I like about the Bebop series is that, like I said, it's all different like short stories. So I don't even want it to be like an origin story of bebop or of the crew or of spike or Faye or anybody i would just want it to be like another adventure yeah. with them you know like just pick up wherever and and i think it's a well i think it's possible that it's a series that's known well enough for people to be on board with that i don't really know but i would want it to just be its own thing like just another day on the bebop because i think that's what's so appealing about it um and for the actors like i'm not really sure about the cast uh i think this actually so to be clear a uh, cowboy bebop live action has been floating around in hollywood for like the last 10 years um it's sort <laughs> yeah. of like stuck in development hell right now um it was something that was pitched and was bought and then never happened and then people were attached to it and it didn't go anywhere. wasn't it more popular here than it was in? Japan? i think it, i think it was more popular here than it was in japan i, I also think like because i've heard interviews with shinshiro with watanabe where he said that he actually prefers the english version of it because like he kind of like when he when he was writing it he was thinking about it as more of like a western characters like the whole jazz tradition yeah. and characters like that and like um so i actually think like in a we and I actually think the themes it touches on the sort of like the melancholia and like the being like you know the cowboys like bounty hunters in space I think kind of resonates a little more with like western audiences maybe than it does with like Japanese audience I'm not sure but I think you're right I think it is more popular here um so at at one point Keanu Reeves was attached for it honestly that I'm like kind of down with that, that like that for Keanu cool to that, play yeah. Spike um I think that's kind of cool um, I've read other people say that Joseph Gordon-Levitt would be a good choice. I think he has like a similar facial thing, kind of like the the like you know thin, wiry thing that Spike has going on. My choice for Faye is actually the woman from Ten Cloverfield Lane, yeah, Mary yeah. Elizabeth Winstead, yeah. who I didn't really know that well. She also played, I think, Ramona Flowers in uh, the Scott Pilgrim um, movie. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. Um, I didn't really know her that well before Ten Cloverfield, but like I was just looking at her and like. I think she kind of has like the like a like the right facial features and she kind of like she looks really close with like the sort of short bob hair kind of thing that Faye does you know like Faye is kind of like Faye Valentine one of the characters in Bebop is like very overtly sexual in some ways but then also kind of like very dark and like messed up in some other ways and I feel like she could do a good capture of that and then for Jet Black I was kind of thinking like Idris Elba maybe <laughs> cuz I um cuz I think he would be a he has like the right kind of voice like Jet has this very like dark commanding voice and I think he's kind of like the one who stays with the ship and is like the voice of reason so I I'm not entirely like wedded to that but if there was a cast of like Keanu Reeves, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Idris Elba like I think that's kind of a cool cast and like I would just like to see that happen as an extension of the Bebop universe um Again, like I said, not an origin story, not a reboot of Bebop, just another day in the life of those characters. And I think Wong Kar Wai could bring a really cool feel to it. Uh, I'm okay with everything you just said, <laughs> as long as Yoko Kano does the music. Yeah, the music is pretty, yeah, because it has to be kind of like an acid jazz kind of yeah. like she, feeling to it. She just, I her soundtracks are just amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, just everything that she's done, she just gives it this extra touch yeah, yeah i agree what do you think mj is that how 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 good is that on your radar of of things you would want to see i agree uh with majority of it i always uh, i'm gonna sound like a huge bummer oh, no, <laughs> i'm always that person i'm sorry but uh like with fan casting stuff it always fan casting of, is tough i know i know it gets annoying a little bit not to say that yours is, but um, <laughs> just in the sense of like, oh yeah, I want this person to be this person, and then eventually it's just like, it's just it's just a one of those like mega cast movies where it's just a bunch of like yeah, stars, it's just a bunch of like famous people. I know, it's cast like, I stars. Can, like I can't say like, oh, I want it to be this unknown person because I don't know them. You know, like, yeah, I'm not exactly. like all the cast. So like, obviously, I'm casting. That's I was thinking that too when I was writing this down. I was like, well, this is just a bunch of A list people like that I can think of off the top of my head. It's a little yeah. bit unrealistic, like. So I think you're right in that sense. So, so I mean, that's just me being a curmudgeon, and that's kind of my nature <laughs> is to be a curmudgeon. <laughs> but uh, I mean, aside from that, I mean, I have nothing wrong against any of those people that you picked. I think Idris Elba is probably one of my favorite actors, especially when you give him the right stuff. He's got uh, a fucking him. fantastic voice too. Like, have I you ever seen Luther? So good. Have you? I seen have actually Luther? not seen Luther. No, you I want need to. to correct yourself but uh <laughs> step correct son dude that show's so good if you love po- like police procedurals 
That's yeah, really my cool. uh, my roommate um from a couple years ago used to used to crush episodes of Luther just on the rig. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but yeah, I, I agree. Especially the the part about the the music. Music is is I think essential. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's in it's in development hell. That's like actually a movie that we could see one day. I, I don't know. I mean, I think Akira is another one that's been in development. Like, there's a bunch of anime that have been, and also I, I feel like Keanu Reeves was attached to that at some point. Too. Yeah, he I don't was. know. He's attached, but to he's attached to everything. So I don't know. I mean, Ghost in the Shell, um, with Scarlett Johansson, like I I wasn't huge on, and I don't know if that was kind of like a let's test the waters and see like where we can go with anime adaptations, but uh, something I'm open to, you know, especially if it's more of a mood based thing rather than like a story based thing. So. That's my choice. MG, you got a you got a pitch for us? Uh yeah, hold on. My computer just freaked out for a second. All right. I'm still here, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm you're not, still, you're still on the call. Hmm. Okay. Cuz it my screen just like turned off by itself. Don't tell them how um, the sausage is made. They can't know. Uh, uh just looking at my comic book shelves, I'm like, what would be a good one without <laughs> being cuz my my issue with adaptations, I'm not a big fan of adaptations often especially when I'm familiar with the source material. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, what I ends that. up happening is I'm like, ah, oh, but they're missing this. And like, without the context, it doesn't have the same effect. And like, you know, this is just things that go on in my mind. So I'm like the things that I think make some of the best adaptations are oftentimes where the source material is really, um, it's really small in a way that you can expand it as opposed to trying to cram like, you know, for comics in, instead of trying to cram, you know, 200 issues into, into, a, you know, one hour and a half movie. That was the problem with the, uh, what the dark tower, right? Everybody That's the problem like, with a lot of movies. You have seven books. Like, How shit. Can you make a two hour movie out of seven books yeah. <laughs> or whatever, however many books it is. Yeah. And then also it's either that, or you have the problem of making seven movies to, you know, yeah, and that that at it. that point, I'm just like, oh fuck, like I, it, I don't know. I'm I'm not a fan of adaptations in that sense. I, uh, sorry, that I kind of that kind of touches on something I was going to say earlier about uh, a lot of the, uh, especially the comic um, movies, yeah, big time are like they're always like, ap- you know, apocalypse, the end of the world. I and and there are a few. Ghost World like, is like one of my favorites that's like a movie, but it's like just a, so low stakes, you know? Yeah. Like it's a, like it's like an adaptation of a comic book, but it's not like you're saying, like it's not like superheroes end of the world kind of thing. I would like to see more like that. And I think the second Wolverine movie was sort of like they toned it down. Like the stakes were not the world. It was yeah. a story, but you know, and uh, maybe Deadpool was, is that? Yeah, similar, low stake. I, yeah. I do think the stakes were pretty low in terms of, of like. It was more of a story than as opposed story. to a huge. And I would like to see more story. of that. Uh, I, I think they, they don't, <laughs> they have not mined that. And it's going to, end of the world is going to get kind of. It old is. Old. You can't, it's, you can't it's keep on reading the old. stakes every movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so I just had to kind of air some gripes real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but. I was looking at my shelves and I'm like, you know what would be a really cool one is a, uh, I, cause I don't know if you've read, uh, the Sergeant rock book that Brian Azarello did, uh, was it? Called? Yeah, I think I did. It was it uh, between uh, hell and a hard place. place. Yeah. I've read that. It's not a great book. Uh, but I think the story is super interesting and really self-contained in the, in the way that you could make a really good movie out of it. Uh, cause the story is essentially without giving anything away, it's, uh, Sergeant rock, you know, it's set what during Vietnam, right? Um, yeah, I think rock is Vietnam. No, no, this one's a uh, world war two. Now I think about it. Uh, yeah. World war two. Cause there's the Nazis in it. So it, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> That's how you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, his team, they capture, they take a, a Nazi prisoner. And then uh, something happens and that Nazi prisoner ends up getting killed by one of the squad members of, you know, uh, of Easy Company. Of Star- yeah, of Easy Company. And it kind of becomes like a detective story of like who killed him because they weren't, you know, it's kind of like who could do who could have done this. 
uh and it's like that story kind of unfolds throughout the book it's a really short book and i think that's kind of a detriment to the story because i think they could have done more with it and the story is just kind of okay and in this case i think doing a movie they could do a better job with it because i think the premise is really cool i think it's super interesting um and so maybe a, a movie would would be able to adapt the material and expand upon it and make it more cinematic because it seems like a very cinematic type of story it's a it's almost like a noir detective it's kind of thing. like a piece in a certain sense of like the like whodunit kind of deal yeah except for it's set in the in in um uh, during world war ii like yeah. in a war yeah. setting so you know there's a war going on but you're also having like a detective like figuring out what's going on like who could have done it out of like people that he's you know that 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 they share the same uh like values uh, with <laughs> yeah well not values but just like they sleep next to these people like oh, they're supposed yeah, to yeah. entrust their lives with with each other you know with these people so i think that's that would be a really interesting thing to adapt or at least try and <clears throat> improve <clears throat> yeah that's my suggestion i think that's a good pick i would like to see sergeant rock I, I, it's tough to like it's I don't know if you could get if you could have like a standalone Sergeant Rock thing without being tied into the rest of the like, you know the comics multiverse. But if they did, if they did it, I would love to see it. I think Sergeant Rock could also make a good um, series, like a limited series, um, instead of just like a film. It could be really cool. A lot of the military uh, movies are very popular right now. Yeah, so I would totally be down for that. Nice. What's your second there, uh, Don? Okay, so. Uh, my second is uh, one of the works of Alejandro Jodorowsky uh, with a huge popularity of the documentary Jodorowsky's Dune a couple years ago, um, perhaps an adaptation of uh, one of his creations, you know, done his way, the way he wants it. Yeah, I know uh, Refn was, because in that documentary, Nicholas Wanning Refn sort of says like, at one point Refn was attached to direct an in-call movie. Okay. And I don't know if that's still in the, I air, wouldn't be but... surprised, but I, I I don't know anything myself. I just I, know that he was at one point attached to adapt uh, the in call. Yeah. Which, how the fuck do you attack that movie? I, just, I don't know. <laughs> you know I want to see some craziness. You know, <laughs> I've heard talk and I, yeah, I want to hear. I want to hear something. See Which something. one of his things would you like? To oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, you know. it doesn't have to be Meta Barons. It doesn't have to be the in call. It doesn't have to be Tetna Priests. Um, it could be something else but um i'd like it know, to be meta barons just so they could explain flying of their planes with their penises <laughs> i'd like well, to see that scene just being you know explained to a general audience <laughs> yeah i think you might i don't know man hodorowski stuff is so far down a rabbit hole i don't know well i i, I don't know i think we're ready for it i think uh... <laughs> the hodoverse yeah, I think that would be cool. I mean, I don't know what, like I said, do you have any idea of, of a person to, to tackle it? I almost feel like... Uh, well, him. Reffin? Oh, I no, know. Hodorowsky Hodor himself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, dude, that would be too crazy. I mean, I feel that, like you need somebody saying, else like, to adapt it. You know, I don't do know. It, do it his way. You know, like, uh, maybe, like, as it, do, uh, maybe nothing so epic as one of those, but like something where he gets to just do it the way he wants something like really imaginative you know it doesn't and you know i don't think the dune is going to happen but uh it's a, what's his name? so apparently i've been saying it dennis villanuvo but somebody i've heard a bunch of people recently online say it's actually denny denny, denny villanu yeah. so apparently i've just been saying it totally wrong um but he's attached to direct dune Okay. Uh, right now, the recently after Blade Runner, I think Denny Villeneuve was the was the most recent name attached to Dune. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's quite a thing. I, I, if if Hodorowski was doing it himself, I would kind of like to see something like uh, Arzak because I feel like that one's kind of like free dream association, like sort of stuff. That, you know, that's not really one of his though. Yeah, he wrote it, didn't? Oh, did he? Or did Mobius write? I, I thought Mobius. Was it? Is that a full Mobius one? I think it's full Mobius. I I could be I wrong. Correct, I stand corrected. No, you, I think you're. I think you might be right. Is it up here? Uh, no, I don't think it is uh, up okay. here. I thought that was one that he collabed with a 
Hodorowski on. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I don't. No, think I think so. I think you are right. I think now that I think about it, I think you're right. Uh, but the, the the his visions for Dune, um, if he could, you know, plant that into something else, uh, just you know, I I'd like to see a big budget you where know, where he gets to do what he wants and and you know just see something you know totally mind open yeah yeah <laughs> that would be cool nice uh, my second pick is MJ how familiar are you with the Metroid series is that Something not at all not at all okay neither is don so, so it's not this isn't going to be make as much sense but um the metroid series is a series of video games that nintendo started making in like i don't even know when the first one would have come out maybe like 1987 or 88 or whatever i think it was like the same time as like super mario brothers on the nes so sometime around then i'm not sure um but metroid series is one that stars a bounty hunter in space named samus aaron um and it's a female bounty hunter and like a lot of the games are very isolated it's a lot of like her exploring a map by herself in space um and i would love to see again sort of like cowboy bebop i kind of came up with this based on the tone of it rather than like a specific story because it's not like the metroid games are usually lacking in, in in a particular narrative but they're kind of just about this feeling of like being alone on an alien planet and discovering things and making your way through the whole world. And then kind of like, there's a little bit of story in there, but it's not, it's not huge. Um, So my pick for a Metroid movie would be directed by the two choices I had were Shane Carruth. I think his name is, is who did uh, upstream color and primer or Jonathan Glazer who did um, under the skin and I, neither of those guys have done a movie in like the last five years. I think they've been kind of um, absent. <laughs> um, and I like both of them. Both of them in the past have done like sci-fi leaning stuff. Like under the skin is sort of like sci-fi adjacent and, um, and uh, primer and upstream color are kind of like sci-fi adjacent movies. And I think both of them, the reason I would pick them is because they in both of their movies, like if you watch Upstream Color and or if you watch Under the Skin, there's like moments of like real terror, especially in Under the Skin, like when it goes into like negative world and Scarlett Johansson's like sucking people into goo and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's like really creepy and weird. And I feel like both of them have the balls and the vision to show aliens and things that are like unknowable and different in like a really cool way. Cause I'm kind of tired of I feel like too many movies you see aliens and it's like, oh, they look like humans. It's like, that's not that interesting to me. Like, it's like, I, I wish that there were people that could see in media, like in movies and stuff. I wish that there were like Arrival kind of did it where it's like, here's an alien that really is truly alien to us. Like, we don't even know how to communicate with it. And Arrival kind of did it in a way that's like, oh, we're, it's getting better. Like, we're going to learn how to communicate with them. But I kind of want to see it go the opposite way where it's like, we're trapped on their planet and well, like we don't know how to communicate with them and it's terrifying actually like, the, that reminds me uh and i think i wanted to bring this up before uh because we kind of touched on this before mm -hmm. but there's a book i read years ago called um i think it was eden by uh stanislav lem yeah i do know stanislav okay Lamb. yeah and uh uh it's i read it so long ago but the thing that really impacted me was uh when the astronaut arrives on this planet it's described you know, like uh, uh, the workings of the planet is described in such a way that you kind of get some of what's going on, but some things just make are no so sense. unknowable. Yeah. To and it's brain. just, yeah. yeah, completely alien. And yeah. I like, I, I like that. I wish it was more like that. Like I'm kind of tired of seeing like series like mass effect, for example, a series that I love, like a video game series I love, but at the same time, they're like, Oh, humans are the, are the future of the galaxy and like we have ingenuity and you know go get them willpower and like so all the aliens in the world need us and also all the aliens look like humans because that makes sense so we can have sex with them you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, like it feels like that kind of and i wish that there was a project like and i feel like these two directors would be the kind of guys to really push that into something that's like really creepy and not familiar um i would write a little, i want it to be written by alex garland um so I think he's written some good sci-fi in the past. Yeah. And like, I almost sort of envision the movie as like a reverse dread because like the concept of dread, you know, being like, Oh, we're trapped in a building and we have to go up to the top and get this person out. Uh, 
like Metroid could be kind of the opposite because a lot of the movies are like, oh, you're chasing a Metroid, but then you get stuck on the planet. So it's like Samus, the character is like stuck on a planet. And now the whole movie is about her getting out to her spaceship and escaping or something like that. And I like the way Alex Garland wrote Ex Machina and the uh, I don't remember what the robot's name is, but the female robot in that. I liked his um, who's the judge uh, Anderson in Judge Dredd. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I liked uh, Judge Anderson in that movie. I don't remember who the actress was, but I thought he wrote her really well. And like Samus kind of has a similar vibe, like this badass female bounty hunter. And my pick for Samus would be either Summer Glau. I like her a lot from the um from like Firefly and Terminator and stuff like that. Or the woman who was Electra in um Daredevil. Okay. Elodie Young, I think or is her name. Um I would want somebody like that, like somebody who's not like I wouldn't want it to be like Charlize Theron or like or like somebody who's really, really obvious. I would want it to kind of be like a little bit under and then also very importantly i want the music to be done by disaster piece who is the guy who did the soundtrack for it follows okay and he's also done a number of video game soundtracks and i i think the soundtrack for it follows is super cool like analog synths and creepy weird noises and stuff so like i feel like if we mush all these things together we kind of get like my dream vision of a metroid movie which is like (laughs) isolated like creepy music like you know, a well-written kind of like tough female character in some particularly trying situation. And then the directorial vision to kind of take it somewhere that's uh, not very conventional with the way we deal with aliens and science fiction. Like so that, that's kind of my dream Metroid mashing would be something like that. And I remember the name of uh, Anderson is uh, Olivia Thirlby. Oh, okay. Yeah. Th- yeah. Like yeah. You're right. yeah. Like I that. mean, Hell, she was. She might be a good Samus. I, don't know. I was, thought she was awesome in Dread. She was so, great. Yeah, yeah so that would be a cool great. choice. Um, yeah, so that's my like Metroid pitch. I would love to see that happen, and I I think it could be a really cool, tight, isolated hour and a half movie. You know, just like Dread or The Raid or whatever. Like, put yeah. it in a something that's not a big universe thing. Just as like, okay, land on this planet, shit goes wrong. What happens next? Kind yeah. of deal. You know, like really tight. That that's my pitch. Cool, <laughs> sounds good. You gotta you gotta finish up for us, MJ. Yeah, I do actually. Um, Hit me. Originally, I'd mentioned to you I'd like to see uh, like a Joe Nesbo Harry Hole book, but apparently the Snowman <laughs> was terrible. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but yeah, everyone that I've spoken to about it says it's awful, which makes me sad because I like that series. Um, I don't know anything about it. It's like Nor, but set in Sweden. What is it? Sweden or Norwegian? Anyway, um, I've seen the so covers it's... of the books, but I <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. It's like detective stuff. Um, he has a really interesting way of writing his characters. But anyway, uh, that's not the one I'm gonna pick. The one I'm gonna pick is uh, Grant Morrison's We Three. Oh, that would be a cool one. But done. In a Don Bluth style animation. <laughs> okay. I think that'd be awesome. Cause it would be, I think it would be cool because it's, because you get to, you're not limited in a sense by like animation or, or I mean, uh, limited in, in the sense of like having to do live action or CGI crazy stuff. I would just like it to be kind of like an old school animated film, but done with like this really, <laughs> kind of dark morbid sense of like west you know homeward bound but with homeward like bound, robot with, yeah, yeah robot with like rocket killer <laughs> robot dog and, pets in yeah some, in some ways i think that's might be harder to do now than the uh the computer yeah it probably would be but i think it would it would lend to that like aesthetic of of I don't know. I think it would feel like a lot warmer. It wouldn't be I like such also... clean, like clean edges. Because mo- mo- a lot of modern animation nowadays is is done in such a way that it's almost sterile uh, for certain things because we use computers a lot. We use a lot of, but I, I, I'd like to see kind of like more of that, a little bit like rough around the edges uh, animation style with We Three. I think it would. I think it would lend to the story a bit I think more. Frank Quitely's art kind of looks like that too. Yeah, like yeah. It, it has like a certain uh, elasticity and like texturalness to it that's like not very clean. It's kind of rough and like and like weird. Um, so I, I, I and especially the way he lays out some of the panels in 
in Wii 3 specifically is pretty wild. So I think like taking his blueprint and kind of expanding it to an animated feature, that would be real. I would think that'd be really cool. I would love to see that. Yeah, so I'd be interested. And then, I mean, you wouldn't have very many voice actors because they're dogs and then when they're like they're they're pets and then when they speak they they say like three words so and i think it would be a good heart-wrenching like semi-violent story (laughs) which i which i think would also another reason why i'd want that kind of like don bluth because don bluth always had that thing of like doing children's films but then they also kind of had yeah, there was always like a little bit of like really dark undertones to some of the like the storytelling or even the animation itself. There was like a little bit of of that like adult, uh, like some more adult type themes like seeping into it. So I think that would kind of lend to the story itself. I kind of think of like the 80s when I, when I think about like that time period of like, uh, what else is it? Like the Jim Henson movies and like Don Bluth stuff. Like it kind of feels to me like kids they were like kids properties that were pretty dark back then. You know what I mean? Like, like things that were like had were marketed as kids, but like some of the themes that the characters were coming by or like the things that were happening in the world were like pretty scary <laughs> like yeah, in like yeah. a certain way. So children I, weren't so fragile. Yeah. I, I would like to, I would yeah. like to see a return to that a little bit, like having some, some kids or at least younger audience marketed stuff that has dark themes in it. You know? Yeah. I think they can take it. Yeah, I think so. Or you just end up with a generation like us, which is <laughs> fucked up and wanting to watch uh, dogs kill each other in robo suits. <laughs> it's hard to know. I wouldn't have it any. Other I wouldn't way. have it any other way. <laughs> nice. And uh, real, real quick, we can do a speed round. If there's any, were there any other ones you had? That you uh, wanted to, I uh... want to say two things really quick. Um, <laughs> George Lucas. Uh, I've I've heard Spielberg talk about how he has these kind of independent films. Uh, he's like, he considers him like an independent filmmaker, uh, but he just hasn't, you know, he's been a uh, star Wars uh, has been on his, his plate forever. <laughs> and, you know, all these big kind of big projects. And uh, I'd like to see what he's talking about. You know, I'd like to see one of these independent films and uh, return to like THX style stuff. Yeah. Or, you know, just whatever, but like, don't no more, you know, big, huge, the trade federation's grain policies. No more of that, George. No more of that. I mean, let's, uh, let's bring back that Howard, the duck universe, you know, <laughs> um, I, you know, whatever he has in mind, I'd like to see, uh, you know, see that. I don't have the confidence in George Lucas that I think you have. I think he's like a cool special <laughs> effects guy, but like, did he ever have it? Like, did well, he ever have the I, magic? I, I really did, what did you do? You, uh, graffiti? Or, uh, American graffiti. Yeah, American graffiti and THX. THX. And then after that with Star Wars. I think a lot something. of his uh, abilities went into other things like the THX. Or uh, not the... Lucasfilm. Uh, uh, like, uh, industrial, industrial Light, light Magic. magic yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, which has you know gone on to oh I think he's a brilliant technician like I would never in a million years argue that I just don't know that he has the creative spark of like directing vision that I'm that interested in. Well, I mean, I think I think to apply it to something like Star Wars that's so big yeah. and 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 you know, it's just keep, it's just such a box, you know, and uh, I'd like to see him do something else, you know, and and break out the box. George, you got $7 billion from Disney for star Wars. Get off your fucking lazy (laughs) ass at Skywalker ranch and make us some indie movies, George. Uh, And the other, the other, (laughs) (laughs) the other thing I was going to say very quickly, um, I, I say, I've said this for so long and I know it will never happen. But instead of rebooting popular properties, um, you know, like the Star Treks and uh, I don't know what Robo else, Cop. Like Flintstones, you know, yeah. whatever, like there's been a lot in the last couple of years. Take take one of the old ideas that didn't really work, uh, yes. but it was like a good idea and, and actually, you know, make it work. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things out there. I feel there. like that's a separate movie. That's like a separate uh, podcast, which I would love to do, which is yeah. like movies that, that maybe had nuggets of gold in them, like that you would like to see retouched upon like, yeah. in the past. Like, yeah. yeah. My number one pick for that is Scanners. Like I, I fucking love Scanners. I love Scanners. But like the lead actor is, is 
awful. Like the guy who's, I mean, it's so bad. And I feel like if you could, if you had the right person to like remake Scammers, like just another, oh, I would fucking love that. Just yeah. watch Scanner Cop. Oh yeah, you told me that's good. Yeah. Dude, Scanner Cop is awesome. I need, to, I need to watch the. I need to get into the Scanner Verse. <laughs> Yeah, my so my one to shout. I have no casting ideas for this or anything. Somebody make me a Beatles biopic. It's time. All right. <laughs> I mean, like I just I loved the, the Beatles were such a big part of my high school, early high school uh, search for music and understanding like psychedelic rock and the '60s and getting into counterculture and then getting from the Beatles, you know, spawned out to so many different types of music that I like now. And it's really surprising to me that nobody's really tackled them as are a you, as a. Are you sure? What? That that there aren't there aren't no there's no movies. Okay. There's a movie called a uh, Nowhere Boy. Okay. Which was a John Lennon, Lennon biopic. Yeah. Um. And there's there's been, I I googled before this. Uh, I feel like I there couldn't were... find any ones that were specifically. Wasn't like... there one like back backbeat? I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just missing them. Okay. That's possible. I feel like there's like tons of them really <laughs> yeah, i, I, I don't know maybe i'm wrong i was looking for him but i would love to see like like in this uh what control the movie that, that oh, was yeah, done yeah. about joy division and ian curtis yeah. like in that style like really kind of dig into it and it's tough i don't know like with paul mccartney and ringo Starr like still being alive and like it's it's kind of tricky i don't i don't know where you take it with like how much how gritty do you want it to be? Like if these people are still around to see it or like, you know, John Lennon is dead and he has, I think he has been created into this like kind of saintly, like peace loving figure. Whereas if you like read books and kind of like interviews and stuff about him, like a lot of people are like, he's a, was a huge raging asshole for like a lot of his younger life and was like, not a good guy in a lot of ways. So I don't know, like it's, it's a tricky uh, territory to navigate, especially we're seeing the Queen. I was right just now, about Freddie Mercury bring that one, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, and like that. You know, before that, actually, Sasha Baron Cohen yeah. was pitching uh, a Freddie Mercury it seemed like he biopic, been good. and but he wanted it to be like a lot more about the under kind of like belly of like what it is to yeah. be famous and Queen and Freddie Mercury, and I think Queen was like like we don't really want like you know yeah. we're still a touring band dude like yeah, yeah. we don't want this bad image of us so it's kind of tough like in that sense i don't know what you want to say about the beatles that hasn't been said before or or recast them in a certain light but that's just a dream of mine i hope before i die <laughs> i live to see a quality beatles biopic be be made and uh to really capture that story because i think it's one that everybody would see i mean no, oh, yeah. People from like who are like 60, 70 years old or whatever, like would see that all the way down to kids in high school who are just discovering the Beatles in 2020. You know, like it's there's I a feel, universal appeal to that. I feel like there's a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> send me send me links to them. <laughs> okay. I'm ready to see them. <laughs> MJ, you got any other like off the cuff throwouts? Uh I'd like to see them do Blood Meridian. Uh, uh Cormac uh, McCarthy. Yeah, but that's been like thrown out a bunch. Uh I know. One of my favorite, like modern directors, uh, John Hillcoat. He was set to direct. He directed The Road. Oh yeah, that, uh, that was that was good. Yeah, and he also did the Proposition, and he did the what was the one with Tom Hardy where they're like moonshiners. Anyway, um. Oh yeah, I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, he has a, a penchant for like really good storytelling and then just like random acts of violence yeah, <laughs> that I heard are like about the, uh, extremely Tom jarring. Martin. Um, yeah, there's a scene in there where a dude gets punched in the goiter, it's awful with brass knuckles. It's oh. like, yeah, it made my sphincter twitch anyway. <laughs> um, I would, I would think Blood Meridian would be interesting, and then uh, the fact that Ben Nichols, who is uh, his brother's a director and Ben Nichols is a singer guitar player for a band called Lucero. And, uh, he often does a lot of the music for his brunt, his brother's movies. Uh, he directed mud. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forget what his name, Jeff Nichols. Um, but he often does a lot of music for, uh, Jeff Nichols' mu- movies. And I think it would be really cool to have Ben Nichols cause Ben Nichols did a side project. Um, like a solo project where it was just him uh, and it 
the whole album it's like a concept album about blood meridian oh um yeah so i think it would be really interesting to have those two like kind of come together to do something about like with blood meridian but that is interesting yeah cormac mccarthy's oeuvre has a lot of uh, <laughs> stuff to be mined in it i think i mean what no country for old men and the road and a bunch of other stuff has come out of his stuff already yeah. so yeah nice most excellent well thank you mj thank you don for joining uh, all of us on this lovely venture we have with cinema smorgasbord we would love to hear in the comments from you guys what are some comic books or books or properties that you want to see adapted who is your dream uh, team to make that happen and uh, are there any good beatles movies out there please shoot hit me up i'm ready to i'm ready to learn and uh mj you are the podmax podcast master where can we find the podmax podcast information and what have you guys been working on recently uh you can find us at podmaxpodcast.com uh we're on itunes as well as stitcher or wherever else you get your podcasts um if you want we're also on instagram and twitter under podmax podcast uh as for new stuff i haven't had time to edit the newest episode and it's <laughs> been good sitting time on episode? my computer what's up yeah a good time episode. which by the way i meant to actually talk about in the things we've been watching recently good time by josh and ben safty i think go watch that uh came out last year 2017 robert pattinson's fucking fantastic and okay. it's really good so i just brought that movie up earlier and i did not like it at all. oh really you didn't like it at all oh see there we go yeah so uh we, we, we yeah <laughs> but we did an episode on that and i just need to edit it and then it'll be up but uh yeah that's it that's where you can find us did you bring it up last episode or was... no no just uh i might have said the wrong thing you said um, like fun time. time yeah you oh, said happy time. Oh, 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 <laughs> so, oh, okay. so when you were talking about how it's just kind of like all these bad, bad things, things happening, happening vulgarity, vulgarity things. and it's just like it, interesting, it, interesting it just it it didn't it did i i like i just wanted it i wanted it to be over <laughs> interesting yeah I, I liked it a lot. I, I think I liked more the way it was shot and the way it was done than I did the underlying principle of yeah, it. Yeah, like a lot of like I liked why I liked the way it, it was produced and came together and acted. Um Yeah, well I, I have no problem with that stuff. I think it was like the cringe stuff that mm -hmm. you know that we were talking about. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there you go. well, so we'll have to see what you think about uh, Three Billboards. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Don and I, you can find us on Cinema Smorgasbord stuff on the 24 Frames channel. Eventually, I'm going to get around to uh, to making like actual content on this channel. I'm just in like a really weird spot with getting all my life stuff together. So forgive me for, for taking forever to set it up, but uh, it will happen eventually. And in the meantime, um, these gentlemen and hopefully Imani occasionally will be uh, joining us for future podcasts, which we'll be putting out uh bi-monthly bi-weekly bi month i don't I've, i always forget which one it is bi-weekly bi right yeah bi-weekly uh twice a month you can hear from us on the 24 frames channel and i uh shoot us recommendations for future topics in the comments and uh tell us what your dream adaptations are so thank you guys so much for watching we'll try to keep it even shorter next time we all love to talk so it's a little tough but uh <laughs> i hope to see you guys in the next episode peace out finger guns Pew, 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 pew. MJ, you don't want a finger gun with us? It's okay. He's dead. No, He's dead. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, you're shooting me. <laughs> See you guys.